Good afternoon and welcome to virtual North Great Georgia Street in the heart of George's Dublin. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar as we descend down the metaphorical stairwell at Sandy Mount ahead of Bloomsday tomorrow to discuss James Joyce's epic Ulysses with two leading experts on Joyce. We're delighted to be joined by Anne Fogarty, Professor of James Joyce Studies at UCD, and Daniel Mulhall, Ambassador of Ireland to the United States of America, and indeed incoming Parnell Fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge, who, is, who have both been good enough to talk to us today about the political, European and international dimensions of Ulysses. I'm also very ha happy to be joined on screen later by Alexander Conway, our EU affairs researcher here at the IIA. Alex has a keen interest in literature and in Joyce, and this event was his brainchild. Alex will put some questions directly to our speakers on screen during the Q&A part of our discussion. Beginning with Professor Fogarty, our, panels will each, our panelists will each give some initial remarks for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll move to the questions and answers part of our discussion with myself and Alex, and then of course with you, our audience. As always, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to as many of them as we can. Please mention any affiliation if you have one, and if you think it's relevant. And a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Before I introduce our speakers, I hand the floor to them. I'd like to also thank our neighbours on Northcote Georgia Street, specifically Senator David Norris and his colleague Miriam Smith, as well as Darina Gallagher of the James Joyce Centre for their kind and generous support for this initiative and indeed for keeping Bloomsday so vibrant in our part of the city. I'll now formally introduce our speakers. Anne Fogarty is full professor and director of the Centre for James Joyce Studies at UCD. Professor Fogarty is an expert on the historical context of Ulysses and on 20th century Irish modernism and contemporary fiction. Her latest publication is on modernism memory and the biographical impulse in James Joyce Remembered 2022 edition UCD Press. Daniel Mulhall is the current ambassador of Ireland to the United States since 2017 and served previously as ambassador in London, as well as director general for European affairs in our department of foreign affairs. Dan is an authority in Irish history and literature, having co-edited The Shaping of Modern Ireland, a centenary assessment 2016 with Professor Eugenio Biagini uh, with Irish Academic Press, and having written the recently published Ulysses, A Reader's Odyssey 2022 with New Island Books. Thanks all for being with us. And Professor Fogarty, the floor is yours. Joyce as European, and I suppose there's a question mark there. James Joyce was born in Dublin in 1882 and died in Zurich in 1941 and is buried there. And that already tells a little bit of his story. He grew up in Dublin and went to school in Ireland to Clongas Wood College and Belvedere College. He took a BA in Modern Languages and English at UCD. The languages were French and Italian, graduating in 1902. He first went to Paris in the autumn of 1902, purportedly to study medicine, surprisingly enough, but was forced abruptly to return home to attend to his mother in her final illness. May Joyce died, sadly, on 13th of August 1903, and it was one of the ruptures in Joyce's life. Um, his exile is partly emotional, I think. Joyce lingered disconsolately in Dublin thereafter, but 1904 became a decisive year for him. He met Nora Barnacle in June 1904, as many people will know, published the first stories in Dubliners over the summer of 1904 in the Irish homestead. The most important change in his life, however, was to happen in the autumn of 1904. Faithfully, decisively and irrevocably, he left Dublin with Nora Barnacle on 8th October 1904, thereafter they always celebrated this as their anniversary, returning to the city only a few times thereafter and going increasingly disaffected with Ireland and with Dublin. Joyce remained in exile, and exile is a loaded word, as I will discuss, and retained a British passport even after the Irish Free State was established in 1922. He was in exile, certainly, 
Um, but we could also describe him as a migrant and a refugee. He was displaced both by the First World War, um, he had to leave Trieste and move to Zurich, and was displaced laterally by the Second World War, um, fleeing um, na uh, Paris in advance of the, the, the Nazi invasion of, of Paris, and ending up once again uh, in that uh, sanctuary of Zurich where he died. The abiding paradox of Joyce's work, of course, is that he obsessively wrote about Dublin and Ireland and imaginatively claimed possession of both Dublin and Ireland at a remove and from the distance of European exile. Some people argue that being in exile facilitated his giant uh, imaginative project. The signatures to his books after Dubliners tell the story of his wanderings and displacement, but they also proclaim that the books are products of European culture and the result of Joyce's entanglement with the several European cities in which he lived. So, a portrait of the artist as a young man is signed off with Dublin, 1904, Trieste, 1914. Ulysses famously ends with the lines, Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. And Finnegan's Wake concludes with Paris, 1922 to 1939. The Bloomsday Festival in Dublin every year, and we're in the midst of it um, currently, always allows us to touch base with Joyce's work, but also to air, air many fundamental questions, such as the one that we're weighing up today. And the question we're considering is, how do we place Joyce? Where do we place him? Is he an Irish writer, a European one, an international or global one? Many people would make arguments for one or other of these labels above the other. They see, see them as uh, uh, choices that are mutually exclusive. One result of Joyce's global appeal is that he is also claimed by many different constituencies and territories. Bloomsday is celebrated in numerous cities around the world, too numerous um, to list, but just to mention a few, Sao Paulo, New York, Paris, Tokyo, Mexico City and Sydney, all of which have very busy Bloomsday programs tomorrow. In Dublin now, perhaps, we see ourselves as having a particular stake in Joyce and his work. But in effect, Joyce is a global phenomenon and belongs to a community of international readers, performers and translators and artists. Joyce is a shared commodity. Many stake rights in him, but he does not belong exclusively exclusively to any one country or political position or indeed any one reader. I would argue that Joyce exceeds any label that we attach to him and that his work, which is transnational and polylingual, that is with multiple languages, situates itself at the intersection between multiple places, countries and tongues. Ulysses encourages us to identify as readers with the central triad of protagonists, Leopold Bloom, Stephen Dedalus and Molly Bloom. But they are all, for different reasons, many things at once. They are Dubliners, Irish citizens, Europeans and outsiders. Leopold Bloom, as is well known, provocatively claims Irish citizenship when put under duress in the Cyclops episode set in the highly charged, politicised atmosphere of Barney Kiernan's pub. But in the course of the same conversation, um, Bloom also underlines his Jewish background, which is cross-associated with a history of persecution, both in Ireland and Europe. So Bloom is underscoring his Irishness on the one hand and his Europeanness and otherness on the other. Reflecting on Joyce's obsession with the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, Richard Ellman ring, ringingly pronounced in his biography of Joyce, and I quote, before Ibsen's letter, Joyce was an Irishman. After it, he was European. Ellman is referring here to Ibsen's letter of thanks to Joyce, in which he acknowledges Joyce's precocious and enthusiastic review of his play, When We Dead Awaken, published in the Fortnightly Review in April 1900. And Joyce um, publishes this essay when he's still a student at UCD. Joyce, we know, learned Norwegian in order to be able to read the plays of Ibsen that had not yet been translated into English.
Um, Elman's declaration makes it seem that being European and Irish are competing identities and that becoming European in Joyce's case supersedes and cancels out being Irish. Elman never defines what being European means, but it's clear that he links it with a more open, mature, cosmopolitan and cultured outlook for Joyce. Interestingly, too, Elman sees being European as a process of transformation on Joyce's part and not something that is a given. I move to uh, a passage in Joyce's work. Um, his play Exiles, which often gets ignored. In this play, um, the two male protagonists at one moment, Richard Roan and Robert Hans, who are friends but rivals, think about European identity in related terms to the ones that Elman poses for us. Um, but they think about the connection between Europe and Ireland differently. And it's Robert Hand who is speaking here. Um, Hand is a journalist. Um, he's just been given a cigar by his friend Richard, and this is a sign that the two are cultured and cosmopolitan. And this is what Han says, talking confidingly um, to his friend, the writer Richard in Dublin. These cigars Europeanize me. If Ireland is to become a new Ireland, she must first become European. And that is what you're here for, Richard. Someday we'll have to choose between England and Europe. Never were there more prophetic words. I'm a descendant of the dark foreigners. That is why I like to be here. I may be childish, but where else in Dublin can I get a banded cigar like this or a cup of black coffee? The man who drinks black coffee is going to conquer Ireland. In this account of things, being European is politically charged. Richard declares that Ireland should become European first and then become properly Irish afterwards. The habit of drinking black coffee is seen as a continental one and is ironically proposed as a facet of a new Europeanized independent Ireland. And in fact, um, a cancel passage from the play, um, Richard declares that uh, when you can get a, a good cup of black coffee, coffee in Ireland, then you will know that Ireland is truly European. And so for Joyce then, being European and Irish shade into each other, or at least for his characters here. But there are also aspects of what makes Ireland different, particularly different to England. Um, but we also need to be wary of what European might mean, as because I'll show now, um, being European is a weapon, for instance, in the citizens' racist and ultra-nationalist assault on the English in the Cyclops episode. The citizen vehemently declares that the English have no civilization um, in one of his many tirades uh, in this episode, and that they most definitely are not European. I'm quoting from Cyclops, and this is the, the citizen in full stride. It's on the march, says the citizen, to hell with the bloody brutal Sassanocs and their patois. So JJ puts in a word, doing the toff about one story was good till you heard another, and blinking facts and the Nelson policy, putting your blind eye to the telescope and drawing up a bill of attainder to impeach a nation, and Bloom trying to back him up on moderation and botheration and their colonies and their civilization. Their civilization, you mean, says the citizen, to hell with them. The curse of a god for nothing god lights sideways to the bloody thick blood sons of whores kids. No music and no art and no literature worthy of the name. Any civilization they have, they stole from us. Tongue-tied sons of bastards ghosts. The European family, says JJ. They're not European, says the citizen. I was in Europe with Kevin Egan of Paris. You wouldn't see a trace of them or their language anywhere in Europe, except in a cabinet des sorts. That means in a, a toilet. So when used by the citizen very patently, the term European has a very different meaning. This is not Elman's refined notion of Joyce becoming European. It's a weapon in the battle between Ireland and England. Being European bolsters the citizen's nationalism, truculence and racism. The citizen makes being European synonymous with Irishness for sure, but he also makes it an exclusive category and a very problematic mark of Irish superiority. 
Um, when Joyce went into exile in Europe, it was a self-chosen exile, even if dictated by the political and economic circumstances in Ireland, as well as by personal pressures in Joyce's family circumstances. Richard Ellman argues uh, that Joyce, and I quote, needed exile as a reproach to others and a justification of himself. In departing from Ireland, Joyce was modelling himself on several writers, such as Dante, who of course was forced into exile, and indeed Henrik Ibsen, um, a, a contemporary role model who lived outside of Norway for many years. Going to Europe was a reproach and a part of his quarrel with Ireland for Joyce, but it also fulfilled a time-honoured recourse and higher calling. Joyce saw himself as following in the footsteps of the Irish saints who had travelled to Europe, bringing learning and artistry with them. Uh, in an essay, which was originally a lecture that um, he gave uh, in Trieste, Ireland, Island of Saints and Sages, Joyce says, it may seem strange that an island such as Ireland should have become a school for apostles, by which he means saints. <clears throat> However, even a superficial view shows us that the Irish nation's desire to create its own civilization is not so much a desire of a young nation wishing to link itself to Europe's concert, but the desire by an ancient nation to renew in modern form the glories of past civilization. And after these two statements, Joyce lists for us the, the many apostles, as he calls them, the saints who set up uh, monasteries, foundations of learning all across Europe, including um, saints like uh, St. Gaul and St. Columbanus, amongst many, many others. Conceived like this, Irish and European identity are for Joyce enfolded into each other, as well as being badges of civilization, of division, areas of conflict, and maybe partly irreconcilable. Europeanness for Joyce is part of an ancient legacy that Ireland in at the beginning of the 20th century was reconnecting with, not something that was being claimed afresh, even though this was happening too. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish. Joyce's writing urges us, I think, um, to um, ponder identity categories, um, to rethink easy binaries and false oppositions. Ulysses ends with Molly Bloom's poetic but combative monologue in the middle of the night. Um, she is in bed in number seven Eccles Street, but imaginatively she is in several time zones and none. She recalls her young girlhood and trysts with the soldier Mul Mulvey on the Rock of Gibraltar and in the Alameda Gardens in Gibraltar. She overlays these memories with moving, uh, a moving recollection of a sexual encounter with Leopold Bloom, her husband, um, on the, the Hill of Hoth and their mutual marriage proposal to each other. We are at once recessed in time looking out on the Irish Sea and the Mediterranean in a cosmic open space and in the immediate material reality of a, an inconsequential day that has passed into night in Dublin on 16th of June, early morning, 17th of June, 1904. The Spanish Gibraltarian Molly fuses with the Dublin woman and with an archetypal um, female identity that spills over and undermines all of these categories, uh, but also puts them in position as well. For Joyce to be European is a quintessential aspect of Irish identity that he worked through his art to reclaim. Being Irish and being European were warring categories for Joyce, um, but his work takes advantage of the friction between identities and the political possibilities that reside in being Irish, multinational, and ultimately a citizen of nowhere except of the artistic imagination. Molly's yes, I said yes, I will yes, um, that rounds out, beautifully rounds out, Ulysses, is often read as rhapsodic and affirmative. It is also, however, I like to think, a yes that embraces openness, multiplicity, and hybrid identity, being Irish, being European, being nothing, and being everything all at once. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Fogarty. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm going to pass on to Ambassador Mulhall. I'm, I'm really interested to know, Dan, what you were looking for on your bookshelf there and if you found it. Um, well, no, I, I actually <laughs> if you didn't find it because I, I only found uh, my, my three German editions of, uh, of Ulysses, which wouldn't be that much uh, value um, in this context, but I, I think my, I, my, our, my, the, the five or six um, English language editions I have are all upstairs. But anyway, I'm down here because of the Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking from the, uh, from the embassy residence here, and we'll be having a, uh, a Bloomsday here uh, tomorrow evening in the garden with lots of uh, readers and singers and uh, who knows what. So uh, looking forward to that. But just to say that I, I was, I'm considering this um, uh, session to be, uh, I'm calling it uh, International Joyce, right? And uh, I, I thought I should give you a, a little, um, uh, an odyssey, a kind of my own odyssey, if you like, with this uh, great novel. And um, I, I'm starting in Kansas City, of all places, in 1974, and I'm finishing off uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2022. So 1974, I was a student, uh, and I was spending my J-1 summer in Kansas City, of all places. I was staying at a Jesuit uh, university there called Rockers College because it was an Irish American uh, that I had some connection with, who was uh, John J. Sullivan Jr., who was a banker and also the president of the college. And, and he got us, uh, myself and my uh, traveling companion, Liam Fenley, uh, another UCC student from Waterford. And we ended up in Kansas City. And uh, one day uh, I wandered into the bookshop at Rockhurst and I saw a copy of Ulysses. And even though I'd studied uh, literature and history at UCC. I'd never actually read Ulysses. I'd heard about it, uh, but it never actually uh, appeared on our curriculum uh, in UCC, even though I did a BA in English and had some very good lecturers there, Sean Lucy, John Montague, Colbert Carney, and so on. But Ulysses somehow didn't make the, uh, the list of things that we were encouraged to study. So I picked up Ulysses and I started to read it. And the first two chapters, I read that night in my student accommodation and I thought, oh, What's the fuss about? These are, this is quite straightforward. I can, I can deal with this quite easily. And then I reached uh, episode three, ineluctable modality of the visible. And on Sandy Mount Strand, I got stuck in the sand and I didn't get much further. And I, I, I put aside uh, that book um, and I, but I didn't throw it away. I kept it. I still have it because I brought it to India with me. Uh, it was one of the, it's a small consignment of personal effects that I had when I left uh, Ireland for India. Uh, in 1980. And one of those was um, the copy of Ulysses that I had bought in Kansas City in 1974. And in Delhi, I had it bound in leather, which means that I still have that volume because I, you, know, you, know, you don't throw away uh, a leather bound uh, book. Uh, most of the books that I had, a lot of the books that I had uh, bound in those days in Delhi, I'm kind of embarrassed that I had them bound because I no longer value them in the way that I did at that stage, clearly. But, um, but the Ulysses copy I have bound in leather uh, is certainly um, one of these um, treasures that I, that I have kept uh, over the years. And this book has traveled around the world with me to my uh, eight uh, postings, eight diplomatic postings over the last 44 years. Uh, in Delhi in 1982, I was invited to speak at the All India English Teachers Annual Conference. Now that, um, I remember turning up at this auditorium at the University of Delhi. And there were 1,500 people at the conference because, of course, India is a huge country and there's a lot of English teachers and this attracted a huge number of people. So I spoke to this. It's still the largest audience I've ever addressed in an indoor venue because there aren't many indoor venues that I would be able to, uh, to speak at which would, could hold that number of people. But I remember uh, that time I didn't speak about Ulysses. I spoke about uh, a portrait of the arts as a young man. I spoke about the nets of language, literature, and nationality. Because guess what? Those nets were very relevant in India at that time because there were debates about, you know, what the language of India should be. Should it be Hindi? Should it be English? Should it be some of the regional languages of the uh, subcontinent? Uh, nationality was an issue about Indian nationality, what it meant, and of course religion, a huge issue with Muslim, Christian, Hindu communities, Sikh communities all living together, somehow managing to get on together but religion was a big issue. Uh, and, and there were you know, religious um, issues cropped up uh, quite a bit when I was there. There would be incidents that would occur that would, that would inflame tensions and so on. So I remember thinking, Joyce 
although he was writing about the Ireland of the early 20th century, what he was writing about was relevant to the India of, of the 1980s when I was there as a young diplomat. And I remember meeting a young woman from the state of Assam up in the northeast of India. Uh, it's a tribal area where the people there are, are uh, different from the people who live on the plains. Um, and this young woman told me she was teaching a portrait of the arts as a young man to her pupils up in Assam. But she never actually possessed a copy of the book. She was working from stencils. So I gave her my copy. And I somehow hope that copy proved to be useful uh, to that teacher in the years that followed up in that remote part of India, Assam in the northeast of India. Turn, the, turn forward or turn the clock forward to 1999. Bloomsday in 1999, I was Consul General in Edinburgh. And I decided to organize a Bloomsday event. And that was when I really came to terms with Ulysses. Because in the years between 1970s, when I bought the book in Kansas City, I read it in New Delhi in, 19, in the 1980s, but I didn't really come to terms with it properly. But when I was in Edinburgh and organizing for the first time a Bloomsday, I spent a few months before that Bloomsday getting myself fully acquainted with the novel because I knew I was going to be hosting an event. And the people I had there had Alistair Gray, uh, the famous Scottish novelist, uh, the, the uh, author of, of, of Lanark. And Alistair came along and he indulged himself a little bit, maybe too much in the burgundy that we had at lunchtime in Edinburgh in 1999. But when he stood up to read the passage from Oxen of the Sun, which is a parody of Carlyle, he was absolutely brilliant. It was the best reading I've heard of, of that particular chapter of Ulysses, which doesn't get read very much, but he did it brilliantly because it was parody Carlyle and he did it in a Scottish accent, reminiscent of what Carlyle would have been like. And I remember there as well, we had Bernard McLaverty, uh, the Irish writer who lives in Glasgow. He was reading with Owen Dudley Edwards, the academic uh, son of Robin Dudley Edwards, one of the, one of the founders really of the modern uh, traditions of Irish uh, historiography. Uh, so that, that was an eye opener for me. And it was also an eye opener how so many Scots came along enthusiastic to be part of this literary celebration. It, it, it was their equivalent would be Burns Day. So we had this Bloomsday, and from then on, everywhere I've been, I've organized the Bloomsday. And uh, uh, this evening I'm in New York at the New York Irish Center. Tomorrow I'm at Politics and Prose, the independent bookshop here in, uh, here in Washington, DC. And then uh, tomorrow evening we have our Bloomsday function here uh, at the embassy. Hopefully the weather will be good and we can have it in the garden and we can accommodate uh, the maximum number of people. Uh, I turn the clock forward uh, to, um, to uh, Germany uh, in uh, 2008 when I was there. And when I was in Germany, I constantly reminded people of the relevance of Joyce's work to Germany. And for example, I always quoted the phrase that Bloom uses in, in Cyclops when he's asked, what is your nation, Mr. Bloom? And he replied, Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. And I said to those German audiences, and it resonated strongly with them. I said, had Germany adopted that definition of nationality? You could have avoided some of the greatest tragedies of modern history, the Holocaust, because most of those people who perished in the Holocaust were born in Germany or were born in places that were connected with Germany. They were born in a German speaking environment, and yet they perished because of a definition of nationality that was far narrower than the definition that Bloom advocates there, or the Joyce advocates through Leopold Bloom. I turn the clock forward uh, and, 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 and I say that resonated very strongly. And then in 2011, when Ulysses went out of, of copyright, two German radio stations immediately produced a full reading of Ulysses, one of them over a, over a 24 hour period. They devoted the station 100% to a reading of Ulysses in German. And the other one did a dramatized version of Ulysses 
over a period of about three months with one episode a day for three months. German national radio, two stations competing to celebrate this great novel, demonstrating to me this novel had a, an extraordinary resonance well outside of our island off the European coast, off the coast of mainland Europe. I turned the clock forward to 2018. I was ambassador here, just arrived, my first Bloomsday. I was invited by the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia, which houses the original manuscript of James Joyce's Ulysses. I was shown the manuscript. I read from it, read from the original manuscript, recorded myself reading from that original manuscript. And then that day outside, they closed the whole streets. They set up a street festival. And for 10 hours, Philadelphians turn up in numbers and sit there and listen to James Joyce's Ulysses being read. 10 hours of readings interspersed with songs and so forth. But a wonderful celebration of Ireland, a celebration of James Joyce's Ulysses, and therefore, I think, a celebration of Ireland, which I as ambassador was delighted to be part of. And it convinced me that Ulysses and Joyce is a global phenomenon, that people in Philadelphia rallied around, and tomorrow in Philadelphia, that same event will take place, and people will turn up in their thousands throughout the day. Some people will sit there the whole 10 hours, others will come and go, others will come for lunch, or come in the evening after work, but they'll be there because they want to connect with James Joyce's Ulysses. 2019, I was at Georgetown University. The Joyce scholar Colleen Parsons invited me to speak to his class. I gave my lecture. I opened it for questions. It's a graduate class on Joyce's Ulysses. And the first question from this student was, Ambassador, what would James Joyce have made of Brexit? And my answer was, what are the last three words of Ulysses? And of course, the answer that everyone would give is, I will, yes. No, the last three words are Trieste, Zurich, and Paris. Therefore, and you, by the way, you don't have to write that. If you look at novels, most novels do not tell you where they were written. You have to imagine it. They were written in some space somewhere, probably in a study, in a writer's study, the favorite place for writing. But no, Joyce's novel was written in those three European cities, thereby claiming its status as a European novel. And last year, the year before, I had six European ambassadors read the bits of Ulysses that refer to their countries, the Italian ambassador, the French ambassador, the German ambassador, the Cypriot ambassador uh, who read the piece about the most Hellenized Ireland. And then the European ambassador, I gave him the honor of reading the Cyclops bit where, um, where Bloom defines his, his idea of nationality and his idea of how the world should run. So um, I turned the clock and, 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 I, and I said to this student, I said, given the story, given Joyce's story, which Professor Fogarty has, has uh, retold, I think James Joyce would have voted against Brexit. And he would have had a vote because he's a British passport holder <laughs> living abroad. He would have had a vote. Uh, in, in, in the Brexit referendum. Uh, I th he definitely would have voted against Brexit because he was against the narrow nationalism, be it in Ireland, in Europe, or he would have been against the, the kind of narrow nationalism that produced uh, the Brexit referendum vote in 2016 when I was ambassador to the UK. It wasn't my fault, by the way, hands up. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to stop it, but I did my best to argue against it. And finally, um, I come to Washington, 2021, 2022, when Joe Biden was leaving Delaware on the 19th of January, 1921, sorry, 2021, heading for Washington, DC to be sworn in the following day as America's 46th president. He used the following words. He said, James Joyce said that when he died, Dublin would be written on his heart. When I die, he said, Delaware will be written on my heart. 
I remember thinking, isn't that amazing? Here's a man, of course, who famously says re- frequently, I, I don't quote Irish poetry because I'm because I'm Irish. I quote them because they're the best poets. And he quotes Yeats and Heaney all the time. So for me, that was a, another revelation of how James Joyce lives in today's world. And finally, in 2022, on the 2nd of February, on the 1st of February, I published a piece in the Washington Post where I made the point that although this is a hundred year old novel, it's not an antiquarian um, oddity. It's actually a novel for today. And my proof of that, which sadly has become even more prescient, even more relevant today than it was in February, I quoted Bloom's comment when he finally cuts loose hits back against those who are perpetuating national hatred among nations. And he says, force, hatred, history, all that. That is no life for men and for women. When it's the opposite of that, that's really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. Then, of course, the citizen scoffs at Bloom and Bloom leaves and says, He's a right pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. And I made the point in my Washington Post piece that that argument, those, those values that Joyce has Bloom stand up for or stand up against, more particularly, are values that are as relevant today as they were 100 years ago. And let's think about this. Ukraine. Vladimir Putin has unleashed force against Ukraine because he believes that force is the ultimate arbiter in world affairs. He has unleashed hatred against Ukrainians. Look at the the number of what look like war crimes that have been committed by Russians against Ukrainians. Propped up by this hatred unleashed by the Kremlin. And then history. What's at stake here is not history as is studied by historians but it's rather the misuse of history and Vladimir Putin having a version of history that in his mind justifies unleashing force and hatred on the people of Ukraine. So that's my um, little depiction of my odyssey with this book, James Joyce's Ulysses, that I've carried now through 10 countries over the last 45 years, 44 years, and will continue to carry it for as long as I'm around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was most of our events and research and activities, as, as you both know, pertain usually to politics and, and society. So this is really just a, a rare treat. And it's been really wonderful hearing you both. I could, I could do it all day. What I'd like to do is uh, I have one question for each of you, which I'm going to put to you. But I should also say as well, this is a fairly informal environment if either Ambassador Mahal or Professor Fogarty want to put questions to each other, please do. But I'm going to put a question to each of you and then hand over to Alex, uh, my colleague, who's, who's going to go through some, some further questions. So first of all, to Professor Fogarty, Ambassador Mahal did, did mention this as well and may want to come in, but you both refer to the citizen and Cyclops. And Leopold Bloom also said to the citizen, a nation is the same people living in the same place. And then you spoke about Joyce and nation. But to Professor Fogarty, can you also speak at all about Joyce's understanding of of what a nation is? What were the features of a nation for Joyce? Is it to be defined in terms of geography, culture, or ethnicity? Or is there anything else you can give to the conversation? And if you wish to pass the question on to Dan, there's no problem. Yeah, uh, a good question. Um, all the things you mentioned, I mean, for, for Joyce, I think a nation is an area of debate, uh, a place of the, the imagination. It's those lively conflicts that he gives us. His, he imagines the citizen as well as Leopold Bloom. So Joyce's vision is both and always. 
Um, so he, he's looking at the areas of tension and he stages them in, in, in Ulysses. And indeed, even Leopold Bloom and Stephen Dedalus going home to Eccles Street at the end of the day, that doesn't become a grand scene of reconciliation either. It's kind of clashing personalities. Yes, for Joyce, it's, it's culture, language, for sure, but oddly, not the Irish language. It seems to be almost any language but Irish. Irish features certainly uh, in Joyce's text, um, but he became disaffected, um, very symbolic. Uh, he studied uh, Irish for a brief period uh, in University College in, in what we now know as UCD with Padraig Pierce. Um, but they, were, they clashed in their views of the English language versus the Irish language. Um, so he, um, I would agree with, with Ambassador Mulhall that Joyce certainly doesn't think about nationality in exclusive terms, um, but he was certainly in favour of Irish freedom and Irish independence. Um, from the very beginning, from composing Dubliners, his huge, huge aim was to liberate a people that he saw as oppressed by outside forces, but inside forces as well. Um, Stephen Dedalus at the start of Ulysses talks about being the servant of two masters, maybe three masters, um, and one of them, British Empire for sure, but the Irish Catholic Church, the third master is uncertain, so you don't know what else. It may be Stephen's own vocation, it could be his family, his circumstances. So he wants to liberate the Irish from uh, the, the political setup in 1904, um, the ongoing um, dominance of, of England in Ireland, but also from the aftermath of colonialism and what the Irish were doing to themselves, and in some ways now and into the future. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, can I just say that uh, on that, just, uh, just briefly, um, of course, we have to remember that, that Joyce lived a big part of his life in Trieste, which at that time was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that was a, a melting pot of peoples. It was a kind of a version of the European Union, you could say, uh, in that it had peoples from all over the place living in that, in, in that city. And, you know, he once referred to the Austro-Hungarian Empire he said it's, a, it's, it's called a ramshackle empire. But he said, but, you know, wouldn't it be better if more empires were like that? So he did seem to have more affection for the diversity of Trieste than he had for efforts to impose conformity, whether they be in Ireland or in other parts of Europe. And remember, while Cyclops appears to be a kind of a, a lampoon of narrow-minded Irish nationalism, I think Joyce also was referring to the nationalisms of the European mainland, which at that time when he was busy writing were killing each other in their millions, vindicating national views of the superiority of their nation over the others. It does seem, there does feel like something very fitting about him being associated with Trieste, which it still feels like a liminal place, you know, it feels like mm -hmm. it's between places. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we've all thought about what lunchtime was like when Pierce and Joyce were studying together. <laughs> so I'm studying, just a, real, a very quick follow up, Professor Fogarty, and then I'll put something else to Dan. But just on, on the question of the language, that's something I've heard tell about before. Mm -hmm. That like, Joyce is such an accomplished linguist. And this comes through in his work. It's, is it merely by association, do you think? You kind of spoke to it, but can you say anything further about his lack of growth for the Irish language, no pun intended? Is there anything more you can say about that? Was it by association with the things in Ireland that he didn't like, or was there something more that you can that you can talk about? I I think it is the way that the Irish language was being weaponized in the period, not Irish culture. Uh, um, so he is Joyce obviously is very ready to embrace Irish mythology, the uh, ancient medieval legacy of Ireland, which is hugely important um, to him. Um, but he had only a smattering of Irish. Not many people would have studied Irish anyway uh, in, in the period. It was deeply personal as well as portrait of the artist um, shows. Um, you see there learn, learning uh, Irish with, with, with um, a priest and so on. Um, so yes, he has this very dark troubled relationship uh, with Irish, which there's something very Irish about that as well. We all recognize aspects of it. Um, I suppose something to do with something uh, imposed on him. But there, uh, there's a good deal of Irish in Finnegan's wake, um, particularly when he's representing the mom Trasna murders and so on. And he cross associates himself with Miles My Joyce, a monolingual um, speaker who shares his surname. And in some ways he's saying he kind of shares that abject um, conditions. So I guess in the end, I'd sum it up by saying he is 
divided. I mean, he seems to be kind of vociferous in his rejection or forthright in his rejection of Irish in the first instance, but he reclaims it like all other languages for himself in, in other ways. There's Irish throughout all of the texts uh, in Dubliner, as you say, and, and Finnegan's Wake. So it's always there. It doesn't vanish. But he ultimately he fuses Irish with all the languages of all, all the languages of the world in Finnegan's Wake. I'm sure there is something many people on the call can relate to about that, that attitude towards Irish school, I'm sure. Um, Professor, Mahal, uh, Professor Mahal, uh, Master Mahal, just to, to move on uh, to a, a slightly different tack. Um, you spoke about this a bit with your experience in India, which I thought was really, really vivid, uh, d d describing your, your early career. Is literary training part of training for diplomats in any formal way? And if not, ought it to be? Like, would, what could diplomats learn from being literate? No and no is my answer to that. Uh, it's not and nor should it be. My own view of these things is that every ambassador, every diplomat should do the job in their own uh, unique and different ways because it, we're not clones, right? And uh, I would expect my successor to do the job differently from the way I do it here. I, it would be silly if she tried to exactly match everything that I do. I always say to my colleagues when they arrive at a mission, I say, okay, if in four years time you leave and you only have the contacts that your predecessor had, you failed. If you have none of your predecessor's contacts, you've also failed. <laughs> You'll succeed if you have a mix, if you build on what your predecessor achieved and build it out in different directions, build various annexes onto it because we have to spread our message in different ways to different audiences. Fantastic. So. I don't believe that um, literary approaches to diplomacy are should be paramount, but they are very useful. I've discovered that in my career because it's opened doors for me. For example, when I was in Germany, I toured a Yeats exhibition around Germany for a year almost. And every time I gave a, a talk, I would say, by the way, uh, I'm going to talk about Yeats now, but before I do, let me tell you about the Irish economy. I know you're reading about the, the banks and all these problems we're having, but I can tell you now, here's the story. And I would give them two minutes on the Irish economy, and then I would move on to Yeats. So it is a door opener for us, and it's certainly one. And, I, and you'll find that this, this, this week, all over the world, that door is being used vigorously by Irish diplomats, people who are Joyce and enthusiasts themselves, and people who have no interest in Joyce, but are, recognize the value of being able to piggyback on something like Joyce's uh, fame around the world, because there are very few books of this caliber that actually have uh, a relevance 100 years after they were published. I mean, I, I, can't even, I can't even think of any book that kind of has a centenary uh, celebration devoted to it. In fact, um, Ulysses has had several centenaries, because. 1980, uh, 1982 was when I was in Delhi, and, and that was the first time I remember when we had an exhibition on Joyce, which we, uh, which we showed around uh, India at the time, and, and then 2004, uh, which was the centenary of, uh, of uh, the actual day uh, when, when the novel is set, and now uh, this year we have the centenary of the publication of Ulysses. So I, th I think we've used uh, that, um, I, I think we've, we've taken advantage of the book, and I hate using the word take advantage of, because because I, I love the book for its own sake, but I also recognise that it has a value to Ireland. Of course, yeah. We'll find something else to centralise, your eyes, I'm sure. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fun to travel well, back? Yeats' Nobel Prize next year is one I think we have to look at and think about, yeah. It would be fun to travel um, back and space. If, if you had any idea how relevant his book would be in all these different fora, I'd love to know what his response would be. I'm, I'm delighted now uh, to pass over to my, to my colleague, Alex, our EU researcher here at the Institute. And Alex has prepared some questions as well, which he's going to put to the panelists before handing back to me. Thanks. Thanks both Professor Fogarty and Ambassador Mohal. Yeah, thanks very much, Barry. And I'd just like to thank both of our speakers today for excellent discussion. And as a recovering bookseller, this is something close to my own. Uh, uh, it'd be remiss of me to say as the EU affairs researcher that the EU, my question is related to the EU. But I just want to say um, to the ambassador that my dad also did a J1 in Kansas City. So it's funny to hear that, Fado Fado. But he was an ice cream uh, man. So I don't know if you were in a similar gig. The hamburgers were my uh, specialty. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, my question is related to two comments that you've both made there. Um, Professor Fogarty, you talked about nation as a place of debate and of imagination. And uh, Ambassador, you were talking about Joyce's relationship with Austro-Hungary as a kind of a former or EU avant la lettre or kind of a ramshackle empire. 
And uh, in the Circe episode, you know, we get this idea of Blumusalem or Blumusalem of a, a universe, you know, a ideal place or nation or empire with a universal language and universal brotherhood. And can we see the EU kind of fitness, Joyce's idea of a new blue, blue Muslim, or what would he have made of the, the EU as a kind of ramshackle empire in its own regard? I don't know if the uh, Professor well, Fogarty, well, or as he's well, well, look, I mean, I mean, I, I, I hope that Joyce would have been a critic because I, I think writers who are kind of, um, you know, too satisfied with the world around them are not likely to be very good writers. So I think the satisfaction and being a kind of a, a dissident, being a sort of a, being a, a critic of, of, of the world around you is, is part of the writerly profession. And I think it would be wrong to, to think about Joyce as someone who would be, would be up there clapping and cheering uh, for today's Ireland. He would find fault with it, of course he would. And that's what would probably drive his writing. So, uh, but as far as, uh, as far as the um, uh, Joyce's, um, uh, you know, what Joyce's view of modern Ireland would be, I think he would be, satisfied as i said at my in that when i gave that talk at georgetown he will be satisfied that today's ireland has if you like followed some of his advice at least and has embraced its european identity um i, I hope we can we can somehow reconcile that with um you know maintaining a close and, and cooperative relationship with our nearest neighbors at the moment that's proving quite difficult because of the circumstances that we all know about um but i i mean my own view uh, is that Joyce was essentially a Parnellite and he, he took that from his father and, uh, you know, he left Ireland. I mean, I, I've, in stuff I've written and, and, and talked about here, I've, I've fantasized about what if Parnell had actually delivered home, what if he survived and delivered home rule to Ireland, say in 1900, which is possible to imagine. At that stage, you know, um, John Joyce could have been a, a, a major figure in a parallelite Ireland. And conceivably, young James might have become um, part of the new establishment in uh, Home Rule Ireland. Also, you have to wonder, had Joyce stayed on in Ireland? I mean, he left in 1904, but the Gaelic League was only really taking off. I mean, Thomas MacDonald didn't join the Gaelic League until probably 1908 or thereabouts. And Joyce was an exact contemporary member of Eamon de Valera, a near contemporary of Patrick Pierce and Thomas McDonough, and a lot of the people who fought in the Easter Rising and, and in the uh, struggle that went on uh, after that, you know, were not very different from, from James Joyce and their, and their orientation. So, so, you know, had he stayed in Ireland, you, you couldn't rule out that he would have, you know, he would have become a little more au fait with the, the kind of zeitgeist at that time, which was definitely this kind of uh, emphasizing Ireland's Irishness and its difference from Britain. And, you, and it's, but I mean, then we would have lost an important witness that could examine Ireland from, a, from afar and could give us a far more uh, candid portrait of ourselves than he would have been able to give had he been living amongst us, I think. Um, I, I agree with everything Ambassador Mul Mulhall just said. Um, starting with the EU, um, Joyce was never a yay-sayer, so he certainly would have been a vociferous critic of, of the EU rather than a, a, a supporter. Um, he embraced certainly um, a vision of, of Europe, um, but any kind of utopian moment, Alex, you, you mentioned the blue Muslim, always gets punctured and undermined anyway. And it's part of the, the, the fantasy of Circe in which Bloom rolls out all of these, um, this um, view of, uh, of Bloom Cottage, blue Muslim, um, improving schemes um, for Ireland, which was part, all part of politics uh, in the period. Um, Joyce and Ireland now, certainly, I think he would have been happy that more of us are reading Joyce, Joyce's own works, that he's, he's not being ignored anymore in, in Ireland. And secondly, that the, the, the country is, is more open and enlightened than it was in, in his area era but I, I don't think he wants us to feel superior to the past either um, he always wants us to to reckon with multiple different um, positions um, and that's the whole purpose of Eosos it's putting on the page all of these minor characters um, from Dublin life um, that are partly literally taken from life as many many people ha um, have shown uh, particularly Vivian Igo in, in in her grand um, lexicon to to the, the the characters and these are just little people belonging to the lower middle class and they have no grand role to play in history yet for Joyce they are historical and um, Dan you mentioned that line that 
Joyce uses to Hannah Sheehy when she visits him uh, in, in Paris about when I die, um, Dublin will be engraved on my heart. And he's twisting. The original statement was made by Mary the first, the only Catholic Tudor monarch. And she said, when I died, Philip and Calais will be engraved on my heart. So she's both talking romantically and about um, a British loss of Calais of uh, European territory. So there's something very symbolic about his twisting of that whole statement, appropriating it. I don't think President Biden knows about that history. <laughs> that to ourselves, okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I like that to mention because I think also it is the both and in Joyce. You know, he he's not he doesn't reject English culture either. Like he's taking it all in. Um, he's making a kind of supremely Irish comment about you know Dublin belongs to him, so the uh, he can't lose it. He's always been there. Um, and it's also as ever with Joyce, a total overstatement of, of things where you, you should come back at him and, and question it. I mean, that's what he wants us to do. People usually read, again, as Professor, uh, Ambassador Mulhall was showing, people normally enjoy Joyce, particularly on Bloomsday, in a communal context. He's somehow a social writer. He brings people together. Um, you make friends through Joyce. You meet other people. Strangers become friends or strangers come, come together. Often people read um, Ulysses in groups. And even nowadays, if you're reading Joyce alone, you always do it in the company of others. Uh, annotated editions, websites, and, and so on. Everyone is helping everyone else out um, to read Joyce. And there's an international symposium from which I'm absent at the current moment, taking place in Trinity College Dublin and um, UCD this week. And once again, it's an extraordinary multinational gathering um, and brings the generations together as well. There are new, fresh researchers, young graduate students attending, undergraduate students, and then um, all of the generations of Joyceans from many, many different universities uh, around the world. And we do recognize that we're being joined on Joyce, but we're also debating things. Um, so he gives us space to disagree with each other and that, that must happen too. Yeah. I think he's a political writer in, as well uh, in that sense. Thanks so much, Professor Fogarty. Uh, unfortunately, we're against the clock. Uh, yes. It's really been unbelievably enjoyable. And um, well, I fully believe how enjoyable it has been. I'm going to put one final volley of questions to you. There are two and they're short and they come from Francis Jacobs, formerly of the European Parliament and friend of the Institute. Yeah. And it goes as follows. Question the first. Joyce wrote almost exclusively about Dublin while in exile in Trieste, Zurich and Paris. We have Frank Budgeon's view of him in Zurich, but did Joyce ever actually write about his own experiences in those cities? either directly or indirectly. So perhaps that's a, a short enough answer, potentially from Professor Fogarty. And then the second question I'll put to Ambassador Mohol, Joyce clearly has a universal appeal to Francis Jacobs, but does Joyce resonate more in some countries than in others, do you know, and if so, why? Professor Fogarty. Um, jo Joyce didn't keep diaries. I mean, what we know about him actually comes through correspondence and postcards that he ex exchanges exchanges with others very actively and that does give us snapshots often particularly in his early years when he's in um, Trieste um, but the other cities and places just like the endings of the text that I alluded to um, infiltrate the, the text as well um, so there uh, Ulysses is full of borrowings um, from the different cities in, in which Joyce is writing. Joyce also writes forward in time. Ulysses is set in 1904, um, but he's anticipating future events, changes in Dublin and so on. And just one example from uh, Ulysses, Douglas, the, the butcher that Leopold Bloom goes to early in the morning in the Calypso episode, uh, is, is a Triestine friend of, of Joyce's. And it's the, the only kind of non-Irish shopkeeper, um, but he imports him into Dublin. And of course, people argue that Leopold Bloom himself is a composite. He's, he's a Dublin Jew, um, but he's also modelled on, on Jewish friends, maybe Italo Svevo, that Joyce knew in Trieste. Um, so uh, he's fusing all his, his experience of Dublin and his experience of the other cities in everything that he wrote, and all the more so in Finnegan's work. Ambassador Mahal. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, across Europe, um, there's a great interest of, I mentioned Germany. Uh, we once, when I was in uh, Berlin, we combined one year with the Hungarian Institute because they have an interest in him because of Bloom's Hungarian origins. Um, so I think overall, um, the knowledge 
and interest in Joyce across Europe is, I mean, I'm not saying it's, he's a popular uh, figure by no means, but he's still a figure that is, that is, you know, that's recognized and recognizable. And that I think is a, is a value to Ireland because they, one of the, uh, the default uh, experiences uh, or fates of a small country is to be ignored. And Joyce is one of the reasons why we can't be ignored as readily as we would if we didn't have Joyce and Yates and other writers like that uh, to, uh, to represent us globally. As I say, I found there was a resident, there was an interest in Joyce in New Delhi, in India, because of course India has, a, has, a, has an extraordinary English language culture as well. I mean, many Indians probably English is their first language in reality, although they also speak uh, their Hindi and also some uh, some of the more local languages in different parts of, of India. Uh, and I suppose the place where maybe uh, it was more surprising to find an interest in Joyce was in Malaysia, you know, which after all, you know, is an Islamic country. And, you know, here you have a, you have a book which is about a, 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 a man with a Jewish background, which is not something that, 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 that readily appeals to, 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 to some parts of the Islamic world, at least. But in Malaysia, I find, again, I mean, I, I did events with, with the National uh, Museum of Malaysia or the National Library of Malaysia. They were very, very keen to, to you know, to embrace, um, uh, you know. So I think there's, you know, there's always a way of mm. connecting Joyce because there's so much in Ulysses, you can always find bits and pieces um, um, for, you know, that, you know, that will connect with people in different parts of the world. And I've always found a way of finding an entree into wherever I've been. And I mean, when I was in Malaysia, you know, my, you know, the focus there was on Joyce as a master of the English language and the English language was a big issue. And, and, and the fact that they, there was perception that they were failing somehow uh, in, in their standards of English was, was, was a political issue. And, and I managed to piggyback on that to kind of, you know, highlight Ireland's uh, status as an English speaking country, as, as a country with an excellence in English and proving that through the, to, you know, through Joyce, Yates, so Casey, and so forth. I'm very, very conscious of everyone's time. It's just, I think it was something Professor Bogarty said about, you know, the, the notion of there's different attitudes towards na nationhood and nation around the world. And I wonder if places that are kind of more or less inclusive vis-a-vis -vis their view of the nation, whether Joyce resonates more or less, but maybe that's something we can discuss the next time, because this has been an inordinate pleasure. And it's just finally down to me to, to thank our speakers, Professor Aaron Bogarty, and of Astor Dan Moore Hall, and indeed to Alex Conway, our tech team and our comms team for pulling the event together. And indeed you, our audience, for being with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks all. Happy Bloomsday and see you next time.